X3 of our panels that we've been talking a lot about how people can make money, how they can finance their career, et cetera. And now we're going to be really looking at three metrics of health that uh, we're going to be after this panel talking about music in civic recovery as emotional health. And then we're gonna have one on rebuilding our communities, but the panel we're walking into right now is panel 17, looking at the mental health of the music industry. So I'm really excited about this conversation because it's something that we really broached last year a lot. And then some of the folks here actually from that conversation up uh, to then move into where we're going as the pandemic um, continues uh, as, as it shifts and as it morphs. Um, Ace, Ace Piva, will you introduce yourself and get us kicked off? Yeah, welcome everybody to today's panel. I am your moderator, Ace Piva. I'm a tour manager, sound engineer, addictions recovery coach, peer support a group facilitator, co-founder, executive director of Over the Bridge, and mental health first aid tr trained. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind everyone that during today's conversation, we will be discussing mental health and may and it may be triggering for some of you. Uh, if you have been triggered by today's discussion and need support, please feel free to contact me. Uh, support is completely free and confidential. Uh, mental health is a huge and complex area that runs, runs from well-being to emotional distress to very challenging and often unknown uh, psychological disorders and illnesses. Mental health includes emotional, psychological, and social well-being. Uh, it affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress related to others and make choices. Mental health is important at every stage of our life, from childhood to adolescent through adulthood. Uh, the good news, though, is that mental health is expanding both in terms of scientific research, different approaches to treatment, and how the public views it, and in the media. Uh, just a uh, just like our taste in music, what approach we take and works for our mental well-being is personal and unique. And there is no one size fits all treatment. Uh, expressing how we feel and talking about our emotion, our emotional lives is actually a relatively new cultural phenomenon in, in, your, in Europe and North America. So in many aspects, it is unsurprising that many people are struggling. Uh, the pandemic has certainly amplified issues that relate neg negatively to well-being and emotional distress. And in the music, uh, in the music world, uh, where research has shown how entangled one's professional and personal identities are, the strain of the current situation is sadly clearly visible. Uh, in terms of solutions, we need a multifaceted approach that does not leave the individuals feeling wholly responsible for their situation and well-being. Uh, we need a, a systematic change that improves knowledge and awareness of mental health and support for the music workers from the ground up. And today, we are creating change by continuing the conversation so let's get the conversation started. Uh, I would like to invite my fellow panelists to do a quick introduction before we get on to the topic. Who, uh, Sally, let's start off with you today. Hello, well, I immediately struggle with trying to unmute myself, but uh, thank you so much. It's really exciting for me to be here um, even virtually, even it's lovely to, to be here. Um, so my name is Sally Ann Gross and I am the co-author of the largest ever study into music and mental health, which was uh, called Can Music Make You Sick? And was, we, I started with uh, my fellow researcher, George Musgrave, supported by um, Help Musicians, which is the biggest music charity in the world and uh, based in the UK. And in 2016, we started the work of asking musicians how they felt about their work, which is, I think, um, really very much 
what was very important to us and very central to all the work that we've done ever since, which culminated in the book that we brought out uh, last year, was really to hear from musicians and also music workers from the ground up. What is it really like? What does it really feel like to be a musician in the digital era? And how how is this new model of working? Because I think actually it is a, it's not only a new model of working, it's a new relationship that we have with music and new practices that we have with technology and social media. How are all these things converging together to impact the well-being of the people involved in the music production change and also the music community? So um, the the you know it's really complicated. It was a long, long study which has not finished now because now we're on our third part of our research and now we're working with neuroscientists and, and we're wiring up musicians to hear how they're doing um, but of course that was all brought to a sudden halt because uh, of the pandemic so anyway that's uh, also I run the master's program music cluster and a um, my background is in A&R and business affairs and music management. That's me. Well, thank you very much, Sally. I know Over the Bridge uses the stats that you guys have created to help spread the word. So thank you very much for taking a leadership role in our community. Uh, Debbie, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Ace. Um, I, this is a pleasure and thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Debbie Carroll and I'm Vice President of Health and Human Services for Music Cares. I'm also a licensed clinical social worker that was in private music cares and music cares. We are a safety net for the music industry. So if a music person hits a bump in the road and they need financial assistance or support to get them through that, we can provide that support. So in addition to providing funding for mental health issues, we also help with addiction, um, basic living needs. If somebody, particularly during the pandemic, which has somewhat decimated the music industry as a whole. We provided general support for folks to help get them through the pandemic. We also provide a variety of different educational opportunities for people to gain more um, education and um, support around health, health and wellness. So that's a, in a nutshell what we do. Well, beautiful. And thank you for everything you've done. I know many people who have uh, been supported by Music Care. So thank you very much. Uh, Angela, love to hear from you next. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Thank you for your time. Uh, I am Angela. I'm co-founder of Music Minds Matter. Uh, we're focused on the brain health and mental wellness of music communities everywhere. I'm also a visibility manager at Youth on Record, which is a social justice arts organization. And I'm a mental health first aid instructor. So hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to talk about that as well. And then on the music side, I play the harp. That's my harp there in the background. Um, that's a little bit about me. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Last but not least, uh, Aline, I'd love to hear from you. Hey, thank you, Ace. Hey, everybody. It's really so lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. My name is Aline. I'm based in Belgium. And for the past six years, I've been working as a holistic nightlife coach with DJs and producers, and I help them get confidence about their next steps to move the needle in dance music. Um, I founded my company because I really wanted to help shape the dance music community into a more healthy, more positive and more inclusive environment for everyone who wants to build a life around their passion for electronic music. Um, I am a certified li uh, life coach. I have a degree in Eastern languages and cultures. Um, and on the artist well-being side, I've been advocating for um, artist well-being for three years um, in the form of a radio show on Reform Radio. And I've also contributed to the Global Nighttime Recovery Plan uh, earlier this year, which has a chapter on um, mental well-being for nightlife workers and also contributed to a research study that was done um, looking into the mental health of electronic musicians. Um, and that was a collaboration between the University of Brussels and the University of Amsterdam. Wow, that is fantastic. I'm very honored to be surrounded by so many caregivers and supporters of uh, not just the arts, but the people behind it. So I have a question that I'm hoping we could all sort of 
just roll through and it's simply what mental ha- health challenges are you seeing in the music industry today? Open floor. <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, so we recently conducted a, a music and wellness survey, which noted that over 26% of the, of the respondents had noted that they had a higher propensity for depression and anxiety currently during the pandemic. Um, we also saw that 62% of, of individuals were saying that they had um, high levels of stress associated with financial well being. So we are seeing a variety or large number of folks coming our way who need mental health support. It can be in range from general angst and anxiety about just what's next during the pandemic. What what does that mean for me? How am I going to continue to to make a living in the music industry? What's the music community going to look like? To individuals who've said, um, "I've, I've always been a drummer or I've always been on stage and now I've had a year where I've been in my home and I'm, you know, I don't, so I'm, I'm lost and I don't really know what that's going to look like for me after, after the pandemic ends. So and the scale and scope of, of need has been great and vast. And I think I'll also just quickly say I'll, that I feel like if, if we're all honest with ourselves, um, it's the pandemic has been a struggle. So for, emotionally um, for all of us. So also normalizing that and letting people know that you're certainly not alone if you haven't felt 100% during the past year plus. And so just supporting one another through that. So we try to also emphasize that message of people, what people are feeling and what they're experiencing is very normal. So so some loss of identity and it's okay not to be okay, especially during these times. is anybody else seeing anything else? I well, I would say um, I totally concur with what Debbie has just said, and I think that um, the overall levels of anxiety that were always there for precarious workers were absolutely turned upside down, and it you know it, it, it's been really, really that all on all of those levels, and I think that thing about nobody's got a crystal ball nobody knows actually what to say I find that with my students a great deal that they that they're constantly asking me what I think will happen and I think that that when you're you, when you are feeling um, anxious that idea that you have no idea or no one can tell you becomes very difficult but one of the things that I would say that was been very interesting in the in the UK experience has been how how people in the music community have come together and are actually forcing really interesting change, working collectively across the music space, um, which is something one couldn't have imagined. You know, I, I really think that I haven't seen the level of collective action in the music space in my lifetime. Um, so that's been really, um, really inspiring and actually making us feel like actually this is really hopeful there's been really you know, we've had a government inquiry the pressure on the government to support the arts is really there um and so i i would say that has been really important and although obviously mental health has become a huge issue in and and cannot be underestimated i think for those of us that were aware of this problem and wanted to raise the the, the attention to, to this um, area of wellness and health. And I, and, I, and I am myself concerned with the labels that we give it, but actually acknowledging that people need support and whether that support comes from a spiritual guide or from, from a religious community or from a family member, this idea that we are actually needing each other has become a, a very interesting byproduct of a very difficult time. And uh, I think that's something that gives us all hope. So it gives me hope. And I found very encouraging, you know, and, and even like my mother is 86 years old, she's talking about mental health. And it's not, I think she would never have spoken of that before. Very, un, very English, not English to talk about at all. So really very interesting to see even the generational, um, how the way this 
illness, this uh, the pandemic affects generations has caused a kind of generational conversation that none of us could have started in any other way. So I think that some of these things that we didn't expect have produced very interesting, um, yeah, just interesting connections between people. And last night I was sent a video of kids having a dance competition in the streets in London, wow. um, which was really, really wonderful to see because it's the first time like lockdown is beginning to open up and it was a break dancing competition kind of spontaneous break dancing competition <laughs> and it was awesome. just brilliant to see it so yeah, there is hope in this you know mm. so i think that was that's an interesting message in a way well, well so, sally I look, you touch on a lot of things and as you know although we all we often right now feel a lot of doom and gloom that there is some light at the end of the tunnel maybe not in in the sense of depending on where you are and, you know, how active we can be in our community. But as far as people coming together is, is something I, I personally couldn't have imagined a, a couple of years ago, but uh, it's gotten people on the same page. And, and as well as breaking down the barriers between the generational gap that you mentioned, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, if, if I was talking to, to my grandfather about it, uh, he, he would probably say, eh, it's all in your head, you know, j just sort of sweep it under the rug, be a man or, or something along those lines. And, you know, although, although I love my grandpa, you know, there's uh, sometimes just like, oh, well, so that, that's the way they, you know, the older generation thinks and you just got to move on. But now with this pause in the world, we've had, we can't hide from it anymore. We've been forced to, to, to face it head on. And it's, it's uh, I think, a great thing for the world. It's an odd position for the world to be in right now. But I think we're going to be definitely coming out on the, uh, you know, on the, the other side of it in a much more positive place. Uh, so, so solutions, how much time do we have left? I know time is always going a little quick, but if someone could post in the chat, that'd be wonderful. But uh, before we do move on to solutions, is there anything else? Okay, we got 13 minutes, great. Uh, is there anything else that we might be missing here? I'd love to share just a couple of tools and, and tricks on my side. Well, one, I agree with everything you both just said and Sally, I agree hundred percent like this coming together um, has been really beautiful to see during this time. Cause we all, you know, what we've seen in our regular meetups is a, certainly an increase in anxiety and depression. Um, there's uh, some collective trauma we're all processing their survivor guilt, but there's also been a lot of artists and musicians feeling guilty. I have found because they aren't, mm -hmm. you know, creating as much as they think they should. There's been a lot of push like, Oh, you're at home. You should be doing all these things and shooting on people. And it's like, it's okay. If you haven't been your most productive during a global pandemic, like that's completely fine. And a tool that's been great for me is when I'm having conversations with people, it's like, oh, how are you? Typically, it's, oh, good, great, fine. But then I ask again, I say, how are you really? And then full stop. And just creating space for people to actually express how they're feeling and doing the kind of green, yellow, red check-in. So are you green, feeling really great? Yellow, I'm kind of in the middle. Or red, I'm just kind of should get brownie points for being here. And kind of help start that conversation and then ag agree again. Uh, people are seem to be much more open to just having the discussion in general. So I appreciate that. With, with that pause, we've been given that a little bit of extra time to be able to ask that where before when we're working in such a fast paced environment, you just like, how are you? Oh, I'm good. And then you kind of move on to the task at hand, but uh, you know, and that's another positive and great for you for, you know, giving people that second opportunity to really check in with themselves because sometimes we don't do it to ourselves. So Fantastic. Sure. And I'll do one quick plug as far as solutions is mental health first aid. I know we will have to love you. If anyone is interested in getting trained in mental health first aid, please reach out to me. I'm happy to talk to anybody. Um, but I believe that mental health first aid should be as accessible as first aid. Agreed. And um, we'll, be, we'll be talking about it. <laughs> yes. On that note, on another positive note, all the major labels in the UK, certainly in the UK, have now got mental health first aiders. And I've been in to speak to all of them. And, and um, it's, it's really good to see how these things have just, they've happened. People have enacted them. And um, yeah, it's 
absolutely agree. It's really good that we can have these. Now, I always say to people, you know, um, if you broke your leg, you'd tell someone at work because obviously. So it, it's got to be that normal, like, OK, this <laughs> happened. And, you know, today's not a great day for me and I can't, you know, that, and and I do think the the question of time and the question of productivity is um, yeah a big question, but also a really really important one. To what does productivity mean in the world where everybody's making hundred things every minute and two hundred minutes of music is being uploaded every second? And by the time we finish this conference, there'll be five hundred million new albums. I mean, there's got to be a point at which we talk about productivity in a more constructive way, people. Okay, <laughs> I just think like in the end. <laughs> so, yeah. So, what what are some of the backlashes that we think people might be afraid of if they say, "Hey, today's Tuesday. I'm having a a rough day." Uh, you know, that's what we hope people will say. Uh, but what are some of the stuff? Actually, you know what? Let's not get into that because we're sorry. We just got a note. We got ten minutes left. And I don't want to talk about doom and gloom anymore. Let's get into some solution stuff. What is the first step our community members who are viewing us today uh, can do to more to move towards more mental wellness? You know, we talked about mental health first aid, but what is something first thing in the morning that they can do? Get up out of bed and and do something for themselves. I'll take that one. Um, so. I work mostly in the space of mental well-being, so I know we've not really talked too deeply into, you know, what mental health means, but it's a very complex topic, obviously, um, very important to note. But so what I'm speaking about is much more mindfulness, mental well-being, wellness, personal wellness. And so I always like to look at things from a perspective of what is the smallest thing that you can do that can have the biggest impact on your life in general. And I would say in the morning, getting up, thinking about how you want, want to feel, how you would prefer to feel, some of the things that make you feel good, that can make you feel calm, that can give you a bit of a moment of tuning in with yourself before you start your day, makes all the difference between that or, you know, like waking up, grabbing your phone, checking your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, all of your social media, um, uh, you know, apps, whatever, and already like, putting all of that stuff into your brain in the morning is just really not the way to go. And just really taking that time, like the first hour when you get up, like just let your phone be, think about like, how do I want to feel today? If I only get one thing done today, that would make me happy. What would that be? And just really trying to keep things simple, especially if you're already overwhelmed and stressed and having a lot of negative self-talk it's really important to, to keep things simple and slow down and not make it too overwhelming. So I think that would definitely be a tip. Um, that's definitely something that I give to my clients and also having that awareness around what your mindset is like the minute you wake up and then kind of slowing down and thinking around, okay, I can control my thoughts as much as possible. So what would I prefer to think or feel today instead of what is happening right now and raising that awareness around that. It's definitely a, a small tool that can definitely make a lot of difference in your day. Yeah, I 100% agree with you there. What you put into your head is, is what you're going to put out into the world. So if it's positive, it's positive. If you put, pick up that social off your phone and it's all negative news, it's what's going to be, uh, you know, th going through your brain all day. Uh, we does anybody else want to comment on that? But we did receive a comment here and a question. So, uh, so the, the comment was, the thing about exposing yourself through songs and performance is a hard thing for a lot of people, uh, exposed and vulnerable. That was their comment. And then the question was, how do you get mental health first aid training? Excellent. I'll take that one real quick. One, one, as far as the comment, I, I agree with that. I've also met many musicians who actually have stage fright and like, it takes a lot of energy for them to go up. You know, we like to joke is that 
oftentimes we're not in music because we want to be in music. We're in music because we, we have to, it's part of our soul. Um, it's hard work. <laughs> and so uh, that's why having a community of people that you can go to and talk to and understand what you're going through is, is very important. That's why Mal, I'm happy to be here with you all and how to get trained in mental health first aid. Uh, it is a global program, but there's uh, I think there's 26 accredited uh, groups across the globe. So uh, music minds matter. We have three instructors right now. We're getting a fourth train that can teach in Spanish. So if you are in the U S reach out to me, um, we'll happy to get you the information. And then if it's a, if you're somewhere else in the world, I'm happy to put you in the right direction. Beautiful. Well, we have five minutes left. Uh, so uh, I'd like to keep on going about, you know, other actions our members can, can do, but you mentioned one thing, Angela, that was really, uh, important. Although you're talking about mental health first aid was, you know, surrounding yourself with like-minded people there and, uh, you know, shameless plug over the bridge. We do run two peer support groups a week. So we, you, you come to us over the bridge.org, you'll find your groups and, uh, you'll be surrounded by people from the music industry who have, uh, common experiences, both in our professional lives and our personal lives. So uh, anybody else want to do a plug? <laughs> I'd love to do a quick plug. So we too have um, a terrific job. Everybody's doing so much, but we have nine different groups um, that are free in their virtual groups. So for anybody who's interested in gaining extra support for addiction or emotional support. And if somebody needs some counseling and they're in the music industry in any capacity and they cannot afford it, or they don't have a therapist or somebody that they want to connect with or a life coach or a psychiatrist, we can certainly help them connect, connect them to somebody who can help. So just keep music ears in mind if, if people out there again, need that. Thank you. Oh, that's fantastic. I love being surrounded by caregiving people. This is an incredible little community we have here today. Uh, so any more suggestions as we got, as we are wrapping up here? Well, I think um, that all of these suggestions are really good. And I, and I, and um, I'm, I'm particularly, uh, I'm particularly interested in the, you know, that don't turn your phone on, practice turning your phone off, not, yeah, I, I think it's really, I always make this, uh, and I know I talk about it in the book, but, you know, once upon a time, you know, when I was a kid, my mum smoked in the car, like we sat in the back and my mum drove the car, my mum's an athlete, my mum is a champion swimmer and high diver, she has medals, right? And her swimming coach gave her her first cigarette, right? Oh. I know, and this sounds crazy, okay? It sounds crazy to us. But the thing is that over the years, we learned some things about smoking and we will learn things about our internet health and our social media health. And we are learning very, very fast, I think, actually. But this idea that we can turn our phones off, that we can leave them, you know, when, when my kids were growing up, we, we had a no phone at the table rule. And I, I just, I do remember it getting more and more difficult, but I was, we were not having phones at the table. You know, it was just, it just wasn't gonna happen. Nowadays, my, my children are voting adults and it is much harder for me to remove their phones at the table. <laughs> but um, I do think that this is a thing that we can learn. You know, like I do think it's a thing that we can, I think it's a really important thing that you do not have to turn it on in that way. You do not have to look at what everyone else is doing. It came up so clearly in our research how troubling other musician, musicians found it to, to look at other people, what other people were doing. That's the idea that you start the morning by looking at other people. It's like, no, you know what? You usually get up, you wash your face, you look at yourself, you know, but it's like you're looking at someone else and it's like, ah, you know, that the fear of missing out becomes the overwhelming morning thought where you can just hold that off, you know? And I think that those are, they are habits. You know, we've learned to use our thumbs much quicker. We've done all of these things because machines teach us things. We learn from machines. Right. So we have to also unlearn. We have to understand that relationship better. So I think that, 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 I think that's one very specific thing that I think we can, well, I, I, I can include myself in that. 
Oh, and and Sally didn't say it, but there yes, <laughs> buy the book. It's great. Buy the book. It's <laughs> girling out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 thank you. Thank everybody this, for joining us. We got Storm here is telling us we got to go. So, <laughs> oh, this was such a, great, <laughs> such a great conversation. And uh, uh, we appreciate all the work you all are doing. Very much so. Thank you so much. Uh, lovely to oh, see you, you all. Thank all right. you. We'll be, <laughs> we'll be back in a couple of minutes with our next panel. Thank you again. Bye. Enjoy the festival.